we bought a monster property in Sedona. This one is, again, we still have this property. It's uh, almost 7,000 square feet, eight bedroom, nine bath. It's where we spent all this past weekend. Great property. It's why we're in the 1% club, the, both our properties in Sedona. And then we bought a penthouse in Destin, six bedroom, four bath. And then we bought another property in Sedona. So within a year, we've got $10 million of properties. And my wife and I have invested pretty much all of our cash. Hi, I'm Wyatt. And I'm Grace. And you're listening to Our Dad and your host of the Vacation Rental Revolution podcast. What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Vacation Rental Revolution podcast. I'm your host, Sean Moore. We're back with our Friday interview episodes with interviewing short-term rental investors, diving into this game, sharing the ups, the downs, and everything in between. Today, we've got Chris Trainer joining us. And Chris, appreciate you joining me, man. It was fun. Uh, I recently got to see you in our 1% Club meeting, our, our you know most recent inductees into our 1% Club. So it's good to uh, have this chat on the podcast as well. Yeah, I just saw you a couple of weeks ago and and thanks for having me on. This is uh, a great, you know, great dream come true, Sean, to be on the podcast with you, my man. In this in this world, we we consider Vodacy and you the creme de la creme. And uh and to be able to be on here and share our experience with others is something that's a real treat. So glad to be here. Awesome, man. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. And and it is always like these are by far my funnest episodes and my most enjoyable episodes. I always tell everybody as long as we've been doing it, I always learn something just from every one of these types of conversations. And I'm always so grateful that we have members, investors like yourself that are willing to get on and kind of have these open like public conversations where you and I are just kind of catching up on things. And but people can listen into our conversation and, and there's like I always say, success leaves clues and there's a reason you're at where you're at. And so I, I love having these conversations. So I really appreciate it. And I always like to start, Chris, with the backstory. Like I always like to start with, you know, what pays the bills? What got you ultimately interested in real estate and then maybe into full, you know, into the short term rental game? But let's start with like the backstory and then lead into it from there. How much time do we have? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. We got as long yeah. as you as long as the story takes. Right. <laughs> yeah, like I said, I'm retired. So, well, to, to not get too far back into the backstory, and I'll get right to the backstory, and then what we transitioned into real estate. My wife and I, Claire, um, we were in the fitness business. I was in the fitness business for 17 years, and she was actually one of my clients, only client I ever dated. So, um, just to put that out there, but she was, right? And we were in our mid 20s. And uh, she was awesome, ex-college soccer player, semi-pro, and uh, and we just, you know, were complete opposites, but ended up coming together and, and getting married. And and shortly after we got married, um, we found the sport of CrossFit. I don't know if you're familiar with that or have heard of that before, but um, I had a very successful personal training business since I was 24 years old. And um, I guess at this point I was 26, 27 years old when we found CrossFit. We transferred everything into that and started our own gym and uh, we're very successful at that and did that for 11 years and we built several locate or two locations and we built bot land and built our gym from the ground up and really had just an amazing decade at doing that. And, and along that time we had our daughter and we're still able to um, do the business and have our daughter, but we were we were maturing and kind of seeing that there wasn't really any light at the end of the tunnel. Um, we're so invested in our community and our people that we we not only had our daughter, we had three on uh, three hundred other children. Um, yeah. You know that we, we that we were in charge of their health and wellness, and and although we loved that. Um, it took away, you know, we only had so much bandwidth. It took away from what, what we wanted for our daughter. And then COVID happened. So our daughter was six months old and the government shut us down here in Phoenix, Arizona. And we didn't have a plan B, you know, um, my wife and I, we both did this. We were fully invested in our, in our gym business. And we had a six month old baby and we're told we can't operate our business. And so the next day I signed up for real estate school. Um, just to, Hey, if I, if I'm not going to be able to do this, I need to at least do something. You know, I don't have a college degree. I went to college for a couple of years, but left and just started my own business. You know, I, I knew I wanted to work. And, uh, and so we, I went to real estate school and, and right around that time, 
Um, we also had one of our partners fall out of our business and we owned our building that we built together. And in 2019, we had we sold that building to get independent of our partner and we did really well. on it. So that kind of gave us a seed and we didn't really know what we were going to do with that money. But um, once I went to real estate school, I found you guys right away because we started talking about that personal or that uh, vacation rental aspect and wanting to do that because it was really coming on the scene at that time. So uh, we had a buddy that um, owned property in Pine Top, Arizona, and I was always thinking Flagstaff. You know, we're in Phoenix, which we've anyone that knows we've had 100 days over 100 degrees. Now I think it's like 113 days over 100 degrees, um, you know, and so not not the greatest environment when you have little kids, but most or when you have, you know, an elderly population like Phoenix does, people want to get out of Phoenix during the summer. And so our natural thought process was to go to Flagstaff because it's two hours away. It's at 7000 feet and um, it cools off. It's beautiful there during the summer. But my buddy Rob, who owned the properties in Pine Top, told me about Pine Top. I'd never been there. It's a little further. It's three and a half hours away. But it's in the White Mountains of Arizona, and it's absolutely beautiful. It's at 7,000 feet. It's got seasons. And so I drove there and fell in love instantaneously, put an offer in on a property, got it, put 20% down. It wasn't a vacation rental, so we had, you know, we put another 15K into it to get it up and ready. And we were so pumped, so excited, started getting bookings right away and did the whole thing and, um, and, start, and launched that property. And right around that time, I found Vodacy. And this was 2021. And uh, we did the whole thing. I did the sales call. And I've been uber successful in our business. We had been uber successful. And I was kind of just like, hey, you know, I, I think we can do this on it. You know, and it wasn't a price issue or anything like that. It was just simply, hey, you know, I, I've never really done any um, mentorship groups or anything like that. So I was like, Babe, let's, you know, and she was the same way. She was like, yeah, we can do it, you know, no big deal. We'll, we'll head out there. So right around that time as well, my dad, who is 72 years old now, was retiring and he was in, he's an architect and in the commercial real estate business. He owned a bunch of property in St. Louis with his partners that are older than him and they were selling and liquidating, but he needed to not just keep that capital. He needed to 1031 it. And so he knew that we bought that property in Pine Top and I had been talking to him about vacation rentals and he was like, yeah, let's buy some. And uh, I was like, cool, you know, I got a real estate license now, let's go buy them. So uh, I found a property, which is one of the coolest properties I've ever been to in, in Sedona, Arizona. And we own that property still today. Found that property, we bought that, Claire and I invested. My dad was the majority investor, but Claire and I bought that. And then um, we found a property in Rosemary Beach, 30A, Florida. And this is at the height of the market. Like, yeah. you know, it, prices are out of control. There's no inventory. We had to 1031. So it was like, hey, and we're underwriting these properties off of COVID numbers, you know, so just, yeah, let's take it. It's going to do awesome. It's already bringing in all this money. And then so we bought that Rosemary Beach. And then we bought a monster property in Sedona. This one is, again, we still have this property. It's uh, almost 7,000 square feet, eight bedroom, nine bath. It's where we spent all this past weekend. Um, great property. It's why we're in the 1% club, the, both our properties in Sedona. And then we bought a penthouse in Destin, six bedroom, four bath. And then we bought another property in Sedona. So Within a year, we've got $10 million of properties, and my wife and I have invested pretty much all of our capital that, that we got out of that, that building, and, um, you know, we're, we're doing it. We're, we're, rock, we're so excited, and we've got properties everywhere, and all of a sudden, everything opens back up, and Florida is no longer the destination that everyone has to go to because it's open, and obviously, the, the, the saturation of the market um, happened because everyone was buying in Florida and all of a sudden those properties that were doing really, really well, 2022, 2021, 2020, now are taking a 50% hit. And, but they were $2 million properties. And so they're massive cash calls every month when they're not performing. And it just got to the point to where the Sedona properties were doing great because that's a, an incredible market. Um, 
but we we knew we had to to unload the Florida properties and we did that. And Claire and I lost a substantial amount of our net worth and my dad lost a lot of money. Net worth to net worth, not really the same. He thinks it's worse. We think it's worse, you know, but he was like, hey, I lost this much. And I was like, hey, but we lost this much. Your grandkids lost this much, dad. We yeah. did way worse. And so um, anyways, I know I'm ran going really fast, but a lot has happened in that time. And and we sold one of our Sedona properties as well because one of the partners that invested in that just needed out because his daughter was going to college. And we did well on that property. We actually ended up making money and setting a record in uptown Sedona for price per square foot. And so that wasn't a, a, a loss, but um, we did download that property. So now after all of that, we are down to two properties in Sedona and our one property in Pine Top. Okay. And after that tumultuous year, year and a half, losing tons of money, we were like, okay, we're going to join Biasi. <laughs> and we re got on it because through this whole time, I listen to your podcast every week. You know, we were still taking in your content, but right. we knew that in order to avoid this ever happening again and to take our, because it's a cutthroat market now, even though Sedona is an incredible market and it's pretty much year round, it's got some slower seasons, but pretty much year round. And it's an international destination. So people from all over the world come there. Even so, we still have to be at the top, you oh, know, man. because there, there's 1,300 vacation rentals and there's 10,000 permanent residents, you know. And so we, we knew that as cool as we thought we were, we couldn't do it on our own. And so that's when we we came on, I, I believe, February of of this of this year, we joined Vodacy finally. And it, it's been amazing. Um, we've gotten, obviously a ton of content, but we're, we're now doing a Matterhorn scan tomorrow. You know, we're going to really get the interiors going and, and, and level up that experience, which we're super excited about. So I know that was a lot, but there was a lot of information there. So, well, it's good. And that's, that's why I always start with the backstory because there's always, there's always something that leads us to where we're at today. And so, I mean, then there's a lot of lessons in there, right. And, and when you try to really unpack it is, you know, you guys are just, it's like, Hey, you know, it, it's like, you know, like we were talking about at the meeting last week, it's, it's shoot fire aim, right? It's like, we're, we're going after this and we're, you know, you guys are, you're, you're, you know, type A personalities, you're going to go get it done. You're going to roll up your sleeves and it's going to make it happen. Sometimes that works, but when you're riding a wave a little bit and you don't realize you're riding a wave, all of a sudden that wave goes out like it did in the short term rental game, that post COVID wave that, that really like kind of spurred a lot of people into this game. And then the wave goes out back to normal ranges. You were like, okay, now I realize that I have to dial a few more things in right now. I have to, I realize I have to learn how to play this game. Not that what the way we're playing it and the way you're learning now is rocket science by any stretch, right? It's just, there's a lot of little details that force you to be able to say uh, how you're going to make money or lose money. And like you mentioned before, it doesn't really matter what market you're in right now. The money is made at the top of the market and it will be for the foreseeable future. If you don't know how to operate in the top of the market, it's a really tough game to play because like you said, a lot of these properties are still really expensive and there's big capital calls and we have to be able to, you know, pay these mortgage payments and all these expenses on these properties every single month. And if we're not making the money to do it, they can be a big drain really quickly. And, and so when you, I'm curious, like when you look back and say, okay, what are some of the, like, if I, if I, you know, do it all over again, we're saying, okay. And, and I always ask you this at the end of the podcast, we're not toward the end. So don't, you know, I'm going to still ask you like your, your biggest lessons, but when you look back at that part of the process and you say, where were, what were the mistakes that you feel like you made? Was it just, you bit off more than you could chew, didn't quite understand the, the, like the actual dynamics of standing out in a market and delivering unique test experience. Because I feel like, in, like intuitively, a lot of people fairly well understand that. They don't know necessarily how to put it all together or really how to look at it all. Right. So one of the mistakes we made, which I don't believe is ever a mistake, but we just moved too fast. You know, we just we got too many high dollar properties at once and I wouldn't, it, we weren't in control of this, but the market just completely changed. And so um, when you get that much debt that quickly, which I love debt and it's a very powerful tool, but when you take on that much debt that quickly 
And then a, a substantial change in the market happens with the opening up of the country and, um, you know, a saturation of a market and you have that much debt. It's just it's really hard to manage. And so moving that that fast was necessary, but we didn't. And it's not that we didn't do enough due diligence. It's that we relied on a market that we didn't understand, meaning if we would have been in this game 2019, 2018, 2017, yeah. we yeah. would have known what the regular market is. Yeah. We were thinking that we weren't clued in that COVID was the reason these properties were doing this well. We just thought that it was an amazing news market and that instead of buying office buildings, we're going to own properties on the beach and in the mountains and do. Yeah. And we loved that idea, but we didn't know the market before COVID. And right. so if we would have, then it would have been like, okay, and nobody selling their properties was offering their numbers pre-COVID, you know? And so we didn't have anything to look at. We didn't look at those numbers and say, wait, there's a 40% increase from 2019 to 2020 and another 30% increase to 2022. Maybe we should go off of these numbers, you know? And, and it, had we joined Vodacy at the very beginning, we probably would have mitigated that and yeah. moved a little bit slower and chosen, um, less volatile uh, markets and properties. Yeah. So that and, was probably the biggest. And I would argue too, to, to your point, it's you just weren't looking back far enough, right? And that's right. what the big mistake was that we saw a lot of people dove into that game during that time frame. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of trainers and, and coaches out there that were not in this game pre-COVID, right? Like, and they didn't even know what a normal market looked like. A lot of people that, like us and other people that were in the game, you know, when it really, short-term rentals really started to gain popularity back in about 2015, 16, we really started to see a fairly good spike. I, I've been in it since 2006. And so I've seen this market grow up. Well, in 2015 to 19, there was a pretty good upward trend. And we were like, holy crap, this is, this is really growing. There's a lot of steam, you know, picking up here. And then it was off the charts from, you know, the the second half of 2020 till about 2022. And everybody started that just got into the game during that time frame. They didn't realize that that was a blip in the market, not the actual market. And they were they were assuming that that was going to last forever. And a lot of the people that were out there talking about it hadn't been in the market previously either. And so they're saying, man, this is the best thing since sliced bread. And, you know, I, I always tell people having a short term rental during that time was like having toilet paper during COVID. It didn't matter really what you had, what you were doing. Everybody was making money. Everybody looked like a genius. And then all of a sudden, you know, you know, the, the wave starts to go out a little bit. We come back to more normal levels and it was more normal levels on the occupancy side. That's where it really threw people off was that, you know, we had basically a year and a half of a never ending summer. You know, people were working remotely. They were they were you know, they were able to travel all the time and people, you know, especially when things started to open and back up, you know, as far as there were certain markets that were really on fire, like the Florida markets and everybody was there. And it was like, there was no, there was no shoulder season. There was no off season. It was like you had, you had a, you know, 10 or 11 months of peak season and that was never going to last. But most people didn't even realize that that was the case, that these are actually no seasonal properties. Yeah. yeah. You just didn't even know. And like even back then when we were wanted to write properties, we'd always go back and look at 18 and 19 numbers to compare and say, does it work back then? Does it work? But kind of our, 2019 was kind of our baseline of, OK, th this is like the baseline in our industry because this blip is wasn't going to last. And you notice even today, people talk about how does it compare to 19's numbers, right? Are we still above or below 19's numbers? And we're, we're still above them, but we don't look at that that one piece of you know that year and a half period where things were just completely off the charts the other thing is like you mentioned too and i always say that the navy seal saying is is slow is smooth smooth is fast right and and that's really applicable in our game because there's a lot of things that go into the very beginning of getting these properties set up if you do have to make any adjustments being able to have the capacity to test out different adjustments for seasonality, for things that, uh, how are you gonna articulate your marketing? And usually I always tell people, it takes about 12 to 18 months to really dial everything in on a property. If we're lucky, we get it a little bit sooner than that. But like a business owner like yourself, um, it's very, very common for really successful entrepreneurs or business owners, they sell a business, they sell a big asset, and they've got all this capital to go into the game. And I always 
in fact, one of our members, I talk about them all the time. You probably heard the story as well on the podcast is one of our members sold an RV dealership and they wanted to buy 60 properties. They want six zero. And I was like, man, that's a lot of properties. And he said, yeah, we're going to do, we want to buy 20 properties a year for the next three years with the money that we've got. And this is going to be our, this is going to be our, basically our retirement business this is what we're doing. So that's awesome. Love the idea. Most people don't have in, in short term rentals, you don't typically need a portfolio that large to make a huge dent. And so you're probably going to have a little bit fewer properties than that because that's a lot to your, I've never seen anybody set up 60 or 20 properties in a year. I never, I never have never, I've never done it. I've never seen anybody. I've never talked to anybody unless you're like, people talk about having a portfolio of 30, 50, a hundred properties. They're managing properties. They're not buying these properties, right? Those, those aren't owning, they're not owning those properties. And so, um, he said, okay, well, I'm going to prove you wrong, Sean. And he said, he went in that first year and he was going full speed ahead and doing everything and getting them set up and doing exactly what they needed to do. And they're one of our top producing members, but he was able to pull off six properties the first year. And and to their credit, they were doing everything we were telling them. He wasn't just buying properties and throwing them on Airbnb. He was getting them all set up, decked out for a unique experience, really dialing in the marketing, all that stuff. So, but he was able to do six properties. At the end of the day, in about a year and a half, they had eight properties, but they were netting over a million dollars a year with those eight properties. And my point of telling you that story is there, and, and for those listening, is sometimes you, it's not just a matter of stacking a whole bunch of assets. Because sometimes you stack the wrong ones, or if you have to make a change, the market shifts a little bit. You have too many going on at the same time, and it's really hard to dial them all in. You know, and but if you take it slow and you get them set up from the from the beginning, you understand the underwriting. You know, like right now we're looking at five years of data, right, when we're underwriting these properties, and and we're throwing out that that year and a half sliver between the end of 2020 to all the way up to 2022, because it started to slow down in 2022, but even 2022 was really good for a lot of people. Right. And so really dialing that in and taking, going a little bit slower actually is going to put be a lot faster on the back end, Right. And so now you guys are kind of in that stage. Now we're saying, okay, we got rid of what we felt like was the underperformers or the assets that we feel like are, you know, we didn't have the, as much potential to maximize them, whatever the, the, did you sell them before or after you got, um, you joined Vodacy? We sold them right before. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I actually left out one of our mistakes um, because there was just so much information to get to. But um, when we had our son in February of, oh my goodness. Um, February of 2023, our son was born and sorry, I'll go. You're, you're going to get in trouble on that one. Claire's going to listen to that and she's going to smack you right there for, for that part. She's just in the other room. February of 2023. And we knew that we were done in the, in the fitness business, that we're having another kid. We cannot do this any longer. We're even with all the losses, we're still realizing that we can do better financially for our family in this game than we can in the fitness business. We can't pour into our kids the way we want, homeschool them, be with them every day, doing the gym anymore. So we, we, we decided to sell the gym and we sold that in May of 2023. And we were super, I was super devastated not that I knew it had to happen, but it was my baby, you know, it was and your it was identity, right? My I mean, dream. And I loved it, you know, and I, every day I woke up and went to work, I was doing what I wanted to do, you know? So, but I, I was like, we got to get, we live five minutes from the gym and I was like, we got to get out of here. Let's move somewhere. Let's move to Costa Rica. And my wife was like, okay, you know, let's do it. Why not? We can. And, uh, cause we did well on our gym sale as well. And so, uh, we bought a hotel in Costa Rica before we moved there, did anything, bought a hotel in Costa Rica. And it's just, it was hotel loosely. I mean, it was five bungalows, but it was operating as a hotel right in Tamarindo, 400 meters from the beach, great location, great cash flow. And, uh, we bought that hotel in June of 2023. So a month after the gym and we, spent three weeks in Spain and then we came back for a week. And during that time, we were planning on moving to Costa Rica for a year at least. And that got cut down to six months. And then that got cut down to a month. And we decided, hey, we'll try it out for a month. And so we got down to Costa Rica in October of 2023 and spent a month down there. And that's when my wife was like, hey, this is no, this is it. You know, um, we, 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 she didn't love it and I didn't love it is, is the living situation either. 
But what we didn't know is that we can't operate that business like we're used to operating our short term rentals in the States. There is a lot of government red tape in Costa Rica, a lot of headaches, and you have to have employees, which we swore we'd never have employees again after the gym, you know, and and so um, although the property was cash flowing and it was a good asset to have without living in Costa Rica and being there, um, we and having to have employees and have it operate the way it was supposed to operate, we we decided to sell that as well. And so um, we sold that about a month ago. We finally got got rid of that hotel and we didn't um, do great on that. We had to end up doing an owner finance position, which was fine because. I started a little finance company in Costa Rica as well. So we just rolled that in and and it was OK. But another situation in the, of us not doing our due diligence and knowing fully what the heck is going on and just rushing in with an emotional purchase and, and buying that hotel. So we bought that hotel, but knew we were going to sell it before we joined Vodacy. We joined Vodacy and then we're finally able to sell it. Um, a, about a month ago. So just didn't want everyone to know that we haven't made even more mistakes. So. <laughs> there, hey, every one of them, as long as we're learning from them, right? And, and, that's the, and that's why we have these conversations. One, because I know you learn along the way, but, but also it's like kind of nice if we can learn from other people's mistakes as well. And, and again, it's not, like you said, it wasn't, it would have been an okay purchase had the, you know, had the, the original plan late that you, you were thinking about actually moving down there probably been okay but right. you know it like in a in a situation like that that's a big life move right it's like you know it, you know if you did it again you probably would have gone down there and lived for a month before you bought anything and see if you like it and see if you that you know the whole situation works with the kids and, and what's going on right and then we decide that's what most people buy. would do sean that's yeah. what most hey, people hey would I, do. I respect the heck out of a guy that just is like hey we're we're, we're going let's go you, yeah. you and claire just you figure it out and then you make the adjustments along the way and so you know Let's talk a little bit about the Sedona properties. I know that you guys, you're at the very top of the market. You're in our 1% club. For those that are listening that don't know what that is, these are these a group of our Vodacy portfolio and, and members that have portfolio properties that are operating the top 1% of their market. You've got two properties in the top 1% of the market there in Sedona. And, and so what was the decision to keep those? And is, was it an intentional, like, hey, these are, these are doing well and they're continuing to do well, so we're going to keep them? And or did you have to do different things to them? And you were like, hey, it, it, you know, they're kind of in our backyard. They're close. And we understand that market a little better than we do Florida. And so we're going to put the time and the effort to make these ones into what they are. Tell me a little bit about, did they just start off that way? Like, like I mean, I know that for those of you listening, there's a couple major factors in being the top of the market. Proximity is obviously one, um, the number one, right? You, whether you have views, whether you're right by, you know, by the beach, by the ski hill, in downtown areas, um, you know, th those things, proximity are things that you can't recreate. But then the next most important thing is that customer experience and really dialing in that customer experience for, for a target audience. I'm curious, did you naturally just do that with these properties or did you have to make adjustments when the market shifted around a little bit. Certainly had to make adjustments and are still making adjustments. And, and that's a real a big reason why with um, both properties, we're doing the Matterhorn and going to use Mike yeah. to really dial in our artwork on our big property, especially. And it's a massive investment, but we're prepared because we know it's going to pay off. We've yeah. seen it through the curriculum, how it does pay off. And so, you know, with a big property, if we have to spend fifteen thousand dollars on artwork, well, that's a, a five day stay at our big property, you right. know, so it's if we can do that twice a year just because of the improvements that we've made. Well, yeah. now we've made all our money back and plus some. So right. we know how important it is <laughs> with our smaller property. Um, it's so dialed in already that there's nothing that we can really do to make it better besides make our guests feel like they're the most important thing on the planet. And that's what my wife and I it really, my wife really try to do is um, be top notch on communication, top notch on, on servicing um, all of their requests and things they need to know about Sedona, because people are flying in from the UK, from Thailand, from India and Korea. And we, although it, it is in our backyard and we've both been in Arizona. She grew up in, in Scottsdale. I, I've been out here for 20 years. 
we didn't know everything about Sedona. So we had to become Google experts really quickly yeah. and becoming Google experts allowed us to um, learn, you know, when we, ha- we were forced to learn. And so um, when we were forced to learn, we, we got an education on Sedona that would have taken, you know, years and years and years just visiting there and, and trying to do it. No, we were researching and dialing in where are the best trails, what are the best, you know, Jeep experiences, blah, blah, blah. So the, the, is the second someone asks, we can give them the perfect answer right. that's perfect for their group. And I really believe in that, that, you know, we, we do manage ours. I know that Vodacy teaches not to, but the reason we manage ours is we were minority investors in the properties and my dad was the majority investor. About two weeks ago, we did a deal and we've completely bought my dad out now. And so we now own those properties yeah. and um, we have to make them work. <laughs> you know, there is no choice. If we just took on, you know, another three and a half million dollars of debt and it, it with our young family and where we're at, if they don't work, then then. We're at, you know, you know how it is. Yeah. And so, um, so it was kind of like, a, uh, uh, there is, there is the only path is forward, you know, and the, and that means learning everything you can possibly do, joining Vodacy, taking in all the curriculum, learning what we've done wrong, what we can do better and try to implement, and then being the best possible host you can be. And it's hard, Sean, like for me, like I'm not a, a needy person, you know, I don't, uh, I don't believe in asking for help, <laughs> you know, it's really hard for me. Um, and so even when I'm going to a place like Sedona on a vacation, if I was going there, I wouldn't ask my host about the best hike. I would go out and find it on my, own, right. you know, or what the best, and that's what I would do. So when, when there is that person that is asking about all these things and I'm like, Hey, this is readily available information. Right. Guess what? That doesn't matter. You got to put on your happy face and get them the information that they're requesting. And again, that's why my wife and I are so um, good is because she is super patient, super kind, and she's able to go, you know, do the, if it takes more than 30 seconds, I'm like, you know, <laughs> squirreling all over the place. And she's just the complete opposite and able to fulfill that role. And she's very good at it. And so um, if you aren't that way and you're not willing to be over the top and and all out servicing, find someone that's going to do it. You know, because if I was doing this on my own without my wife, there's no way I could do it. You know, she's got certain skill sets that I just don't have that we know and I recognize and she recognizes. And um, and I am blessed to have her. You know, but if you don't have that, you know, don't try to go and do this on your own because you're not going to operate at the top of the market because that's what it takes is that yeah. over the top guest experience. Yeah. And I love that you're touching on that because I, I 100% agree. And one, it is what it, it, I mean, that guest experience is the the number two. And it's not a far dis. It's not a distant second to your proximity. You have to have the good proximity. You have to have the good area. Um, you know, good location, good area, good property, all that's assumed, right? In most of these markets that we're going to, that, that's exactly. important. So in right. Sedona, you have to have views, right? You have to have, it, you either yeah. have to be in uptown with a, you know, with a prime location that's walking distance to all the shops and restaurants, or you have to have amazing views if you're not in uptown. And if you don't have those, well, the sweetest phone call and recommendations aren't going to make you money. No. Yeah. You have to have all of those things. You have to have a killer location, killer views, pool, one of the best properties. And once you have that, then that's where the, then you, li- li- the you layer on that guest experience. Exactly. And and that's where, like I always say, like I don't manage my own properties because I'm just like you. I don't. I, that's not something that I would be really good at. And like the same thing. It's like, listen, you can Google that. Right. And and I, I would. I know I could never say that to a guest. It's like, I'm just going to go Google it for you basically. Right. Right. And you know, I'm going to find this out for you, but that's not a good guest experience. It's like, you need to have that person 
on your team, in your case is Claire, and where they're like, hey, listen, this is this is where we love to hike. This is where I take my kids. This is where our favorite restaurants are. This is the places we like to get away and, and avoid the crowds when you are coming during the busy season. All those different things that, are, that can make that experience so great. And it's all about communication, right? It's over communication. It's like the pre-check-in communication. While they're there, anything they need, they feel like they've got a 24-7 concierge. And that is when it's interesting because when we were at like in our Vodacy portfolio, because I say, Hey, listen, I'm, I, I set this up. My properties are, I operate in the very top of the market. I don't manage my own properties, but I'm really, really diligent about finding the person who is that person that can deliver a great experience. I don't care if my management partner understands how to market. I don't care if they understand how to do a lot of the business side of it. I care that they deliver an amazing customer experience and that they're over the top with communication. That's what I care about. And when I find that person, all of a sudden we did our job by elevating that customer experience. When I asked our 1% club members, like in our entire Vodacy portfolio, we've, we've run a, um, we, we always have surveys that we run through our entire group, our entire Vodacy portfolio, about 90% of our members use property managers, right? 10% of our members actually manage their own properties. However, when you were at that last meeting that we had at our 1% club, we had about 27, 28 people there. I said, how many of you are managing your own properties? Probably 90% of the, the group there manage their own property. So it's really interesting because it's like, okay, at the very top of the top, you know, those, those members that really understand how to deliver a great experience, you're always going to care about your property more than ever somebody else is. And so if you've got the skill sets and the personality, whether it's you or your wife or somebody else on your team to deliver that great experience, then that box is a major box that you're checking off to really capitalize and really maximize the profitability of these properties. Because once the, re once the proximity is removed, and assumed, right? We're assuming that we're, we've got what we need there in whatever market you're operating in. The next box is that customer experience and being able to have the right management and how you manage it and having the right communication is so critical to making a lot of money there. Right, absolutely. And that was really uh, eye-opening for me. I thought that I was gonna be sitting in that room and you were gonna ask that question and I was gonna be the only one self-managing our properties. You know, but to see the other very successful you know, people doing it, it was like, okay, well, we're doing the right thing. And and I retired at 39 years old, you know, from my calling, what I thought God called me to do, which I put 17 years, blood, sweat, and tears into it and helped a lot of people and absolutely loved it. Well, God didn't call me to own vacation, rentals, you know, right. and he set this path for us to be here and to do this. But will I ever have the same passion for it that I had for that? Mm, I actually, I'm very passionate about it now, but what what I'm getting at is I'm, if I had an, a job or was still running my gyms and had these vacation rentals, there's no way I could, I could to still manage it. them. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's my job now, you know? Yeah. And so what I do on a daily basis is making sure that our vacation rentals are operating at the top of the market and I can devote that time and energy to it. And if you can't do that, then I would suggest don't do it. You know, yeah. because you're going to you're going to if you if you put 50 percent effort into something, you're going to get less than 50 percent results, you know. Yeah. And so um, to see that there was other people there that were at the top of the market that were operating their own. And that whole weekend was just an extremely valuable um, time. I mean, I absolutely loved it. Sitting in a room for eight hours with other people that are doing what you're doing is yeah. invaluable, you know, so I would right. encourage everyone to. Um, try to get up there to be able to do that yeah. again. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I love those meetings. I love getting face to face and doing that and rubbing shoulders and sharing what works and what doesn't work. And it was it was interesting. Some of the answers and some of the things that we came up with, uh, that's what's working, what most people are doing, what most people aren't doing. And, you know, it, it's uh, it really puts your finger on the pulse of what's going on instead of living in your own little bubble. Right. And, and it's uh, one of the things I'm curious where you kind of hesitate and I want, I usually ask questions that I know the answer to. And so this is a little bit of a going out on a limb, but I think I kind of understand where this comes from. At least it is for me when you kind of said, you know, is this something that God called me to do? Right. And then you said, actually, now I really enjoy it and I'm really passionate about it. I'm curious because and I think, again, I know the answer to this, but a lot of times we get into it for it's because it means it's kind of a means to an end, right? We're like, hey, listen, these are good investments. I can place my money into quality assets. I can start building what I need to build. We've got the time to spend with the, the family. 
do the things that we want to do to raise our kids the way that we want to raise them. It's kind of a means to an end. And then you start to get involved, especially when you're on the management side and you start to hear the, you know, the stories of your guests and the stories of the, the special times that they're coming and spending at your properties. I'm curious if that shifted at all, kind of the, the thought process of saying, I actually kind of like this and there is some fulfillment there for me. It's, it's certainly, certainly taking place. And a good example of that is in the fitness business, I could have a hundred people reach their goals, but one person didn't and then left with a bad taste in their mouth and um, it would take away all the joy you felt from those hundred people. It would yeah. be, oh, that's all I can think about. That's what hurts is that one member leaving or the one person that, you know, thought that what we were doing wasn't working and it would sit with you for weeks. And it, that's what my wife and I couldn't do anymore. Like we cannot put this much emotional capital into, you know, these people that really we have no control over what they're doing outside of the gym or their other aspects of their life. So to carry that into vacation rentals, when you get nonstop five-star reviews, it's awesome. And it, you know, you're doing the right thing and you want to do better and you want to do better and you want to keep doing that. But then again, one time you'll get someone in your house that will say, this is dirty. It smells. It's fly. And what you're realizing is that it's not, they're just looking for a, a free stay, a yeah. refund. And, and they're going to say, Oh, I'm going to leave you a one star review, which has happened to us a couple of times, really blackmail. Right. Yeah. Well, that doesn't sting us. It's like, Hey, we've got 50 previous guests. And then the three that booked after you, they all say we're doing a great job and you probably just were looking for a free stay. Right. And so, the stings aren't nearly like they were in the yeah. gym business. When you get five star review, awesome. Let's keep going. Five, and it, it just galvanizes you and keeps you motivated to, to do what you do. And so certainly that makes you feel better. But you know, back to that that calling aspect. Um, you know, we're not changing lives like we were. We're giving experiences right. of people's lives. And so when people come, we had a family that literally had were coming from three separate countries around the world and meeting at our big house in Sedona. Yeah. And they had some of them hadn't seen each other in 20 years. And it was a magical experience. And we were able to provide that for them. Right. Does that give me the same uh, feeling when someone stops taking their diabetes medication? Probably not. But it was an amazing feeling to be able to give that to them. But what's more important with that, Sean, is Claire and I really want to do good with the financial blessings that we've been put on us. And so now when we're scraping by as gym owners and not really able to influence or, or, or better other people's lives, now we can. And so we just sponsored five kids, you know, in, in a different country that didn't that have nothing, you know, absolutely mm -hmm. nothing. And we want to do five more. And then five more. And so although, um, you know, feeling great about five star reviews and giving people experiences, this asset class is going to allow us to bless many, many, many other people that hopefully, you know, obviously I'm talking about it here. But just to give you, you know, no one's going to know about that. No one's going to be posting. On, those kids aren't going to be posting on social media about how we're helping right. them. You know, we're not going to get it's just going to be our um, own, you know, fulfillment that, you know, the Lord has given us this, this asset class and this community to be a part of, and we can now go and help other people because of the lessons that we're learning and the, and the money that we're making. That's awesome. I love it. And, and congrats on that. It's, it's really awesome to hear those stories and just where you say, Hey, listen, I'm going to pay it forward. Right. I, I've been given a lot of blessings that, you know, that, you know, and more than, you know, that maybe sometimes we deserve, we sometimes it always feels like that. It's like, you know, I, I look around, I'm like, I, I, you know, I'm getting given a lot more than I, I deserve. And you want to pay that forward. And that's awesome to be able to do that. And, and that's what, that's where it starts to become more fulfilling because that side of life is fulfilling for you. Right. And then this is, this is allowing you to start doing that and you and Claire to lean into that more. And like you said, and, and now the goal is this, Hey, let's get five more and then five more. And before you know it, you look back over the years and say, and look what we were able to do. And, and, and it's, uh, 
it's really awesome to hear that stuff. So I think that's, you know, it, it, I, I know you, you don't want, you don't like, you're not trying to brag about it or talk about it. And so, you know, and, and get any recognition for it. Like you said, it's just between you guys and what you want to do. And, uh, but I appreciate, you know, sharing that part of it with us as well, because I think it's important because it, it that is important for a lot of people, right? It's like, what, you know, what are we able to do with the good that we're, that we're blessed with? And whether yeah. that's monetarily, whether it's our time, whether it's our health, and you've been able to do that in different aspects of your life with the gym, you know, you poured into people and you said, Hey, listen, I'm going to help you change your life uh, on, you know, and get healthier and live a better life and, and all those different things. And that was really fulfilling to you. Now you're saying, okay, it's a different, I'm able to help in different ways. And now I've got more means and I've got different means and, and some of our financial means, and I can now go, help people on that side of life, which is awesome. So what's next, Chris? What's, uh, what's the next, what's the next big move for you guys? Well, I don't know if we should talk about it here because it's kind of in the behind the scenes development, but Claire and I really want to start helping people turn their vacation rentals into green vacation rentals, you know, and, and that's something that we'll, we'll be releasing more information about, uh, in the future. But, um, you know, we've learned about how toxic our world is and, uh, We've been exposed um, by big corporate mega billionaires um, that sit around in boardrooms and figure out how to get our kids addicted to Skittles. And, um, you know, we're relying on clothing manufacturers that think that they're cool and comfortable clothing. Well, they're filled, they're made with plastic and they're seeping into your skin and your bed sheets are toxic and your cleaning chemicals that you're putting on your floor are seeping into your children's feet and um, a, a whole plethora of other things that I could get into. Um, and so we're going to start, we're doing it in our own home first and we're doing all the research, but we're going to do it to our vacation rentals and make them completely green with 100% organic cotton sheets, bedding, cleaning products, toilet paper. Um, our toilet paper has forever chemicals in it, which t without getting uh, too graphic, um, that area of the body is very receptive to chemicals. And so um, for the past, you know, 30 years, you've been whatever. I don't want to get too much into the toilet paper aspect, but putting organic, clean toilet paper in our units, organic, clean uh, paper towels and giving our guests a, a complete so that when they get into our vacation rentals, they can feel how clean they are and that they're getting zero toxins from um, all the things that are out there that we, most people have no idea about. And right. um, we're super excited and we're building that right now. And, and we're going to try to try to share it with uh, other Modesty members once we have it all dialed in. Yeah, I can't wait for that. We talked a little bit offline about that and uh, excited to see you guys kind of pioneer that, um, especially within the Modesty family start getting it out there for those that are that are more interested in doing something like that. I think that, like I was saying before, um, offline to you, the market is becoming a lot more aware of that. Like I, I was telling you, you know, I've just kind of always been fairly oblivious to that stuff. My wife really started getting into it. I've always tried to, you know, I, I work out every day. I try to eat clean for the most part. I don't I don't eat a lot of junk food for the most part. So I'm like, oh, I'm pretty clean, right? I'm pretty, I'm pretty healthy. But you really realize how much how much of the actual materials that you, like you said, your mattresses, your sheets, all that stuff. And, and Teresa, my wife starts showing me some of this stuff. And I'm like, holy crap, that's a, that's pretty crazy how much you're really absorbing. And um, even like your down to brush. the, yeah, deodorants and yeah, and you're doing that stuff. It's crazy. Yeah. You know yeah. that. Yeah. And I, again, I, I know we could, I could talk for an hour about this, so I'm not going to do that and we'll have more information, but if I if I listed all of the things right now that were poisoning you on a daily basis that you had no idea about, people will freak out, you know, because we think eat whole foods, work out, we'll be good. You right. know, I, I've learned, you know, you it takes so much to get over just the food industry poisoning us that we, once we conquer that and then we work out, we're like, oh, we're good. Oh, wait, my toothbrush has forever chemicals and microplastics grinding against my teeth every day you know, yeah. that are getting into my gut and staying there for the rest of my life, like that, that kind of stuff, you know? So, right. um, we'll get you a bamboo toothbrush here pretty soon, Sean. I'll, yeah, send you yeah, I'll, I'll be ready. I'll be ready. I told you, you guys pioneer it. Like, I don't want to do the research that you're doing. I just want you to be yeah. like, Hey, go, go use this, Sean. Right. Perfect. Yeah. We'll do that. Awesome. 
Love it. Love it. Well, listen, I, uh, you know, we're kind of coming up on the end of the conversation. I always ask right at the end of every episode is looking back and we talked a lot about a lot of different lessons, things that you would do different, things that you would wish you would have changed. Maybe things you'd wish you'd double down on. What are some of the things that, you know, if you could think about like going back to your younger self and saying, Hey, if I wish, I wish I would have known this, or this is a piece of advice I would like to give myself or anybody listening as, as they're kind of considering this diving in, maybe they're right in the middle of it. You know, is there anything that comes to mind of any advice you'd like to share? Absolutely. Go over the top on stocking your kitchen. I'm talking every piece of thing that you would want in your home kitchen should be in your vacation. And from four different spatulas to tongs to uh, this is my my secret, a Vitamix. Um, you know, they're yeah. a little bit pricier, but you know, for one appliance and we've actually had one stolen, but having a Vitamix, that's a guaranteed five-star review. If you have a Vitamix, um, you know, uh, to your toaster, having enough slots in it to two different coffee makers to, um, just so that when a guest gets in there and they realize that they have, you have stuff in there that they've been thinking about getting at their own home, but don't have that that that's a five-star review, you know, for, for most people. And so over, overdo that kitchen with every possible thing that you could think of in your, you know, a tea kettle, um, uh, pebble ice machine, like so many things that we don't think people need. Well, when you have them in your vacation rental, it can go a very, very long way. So that's one thing that just a piece of advice, like, we that gets us a lot of positive reviews just off the bat by by having our kitchens dialed in that way. And wow. then um, we didn't have when we first started this, we didn't have the customer service um, system down or, or mindset. Um, and what really turned the corner for us on that was we order we order our eggs from an Amish farm in Pennsylvania, a couple hundred at a time. And uh, we used to have chickens on our property, but we don't anymore. The mountain lions and bobcats um, yep, and yep. coyotes. But uh, they, so we order them from Amish Farm and we had an interaction with that company and it was super negative. And they were very, very rude to my wife and very, very, um, uh, it was crazy. I, I don't want to get too much into it. It was a very negative experience. And we called another company to get our windows cleaned. Like we had this experience and we're at our big house in Sedona and we just couldn't believe it. Five minutes, we knew we had to get our windows cleaned at the big house. So five minutes later, we called a company to do our window cleaning and we got a different company for some reason because it was like on Angie's list, but it directed us to another company. And the guy answered and my wife was like, hey, we filled out the online information. He was like, I don't have anything from you. You know, we were like, yeah, we just sent it in. He was like, no, I'm sorry, I don't have anything. And then she asked him, are you this company? He was like, no, I'm this company. And she said, oh, okay, well, we have this, this, and this. And he just went over the top to fulfill our need and what and was just so nice. So you could tell he wanted to work. And um, another long story about that, he was an interpreter in Afghanistan for 20 years for the U.S. military and got out of the country and was shot by the Taliban. And so it ended up being this incredible story all around. But he got to the property with a smile on his face, did every single thing we wanted him to do, and was just a joy to work with. And we were like, why are we not a joy to work with, with every single person that we have? And that really switched our mindset of having that super negative experience to never wanting to have that again, to this over the top joyful experience. And we were like, that's what we need to do every single time is be someone walk away from the conversation or the experience they had with us and be like, that was awesome. We never get that kind of customer service ever. And so that's, that was, you know, a moment for us. It was just boom, click. Okay. We're going to be over the top joyful every single time. And so um, that, yeah, that's, that's another thing. So stock those kitchens and be over the top customer service for your people. Love it. Yeah. Great piece of advice. In fact, somebody was just asking me yesterday and said, Hey, should we, you know, we're thinking about doing this and this in the kitchen. We want an espresso machine. We really like them at our house. Vitamix was funny. They were actually about their Vitamix. I use my Vitamix every day and uh, making my green smoothies. I'm like, oh, I'd love to have, if I went there, having an actual quality blender that I can actually use 
um, versus the oyster, the, you know, $59 one that you find at Target. And yeah, and going over the top, I said, what I've found is when we do that in our properties, we go over the top, we put the nicest stuff because their, their question was, are people going to take it? Are they, you know, and, and I, I've actually never lost, a, you know, nobody's ever stolen one, but if they do, they do, right. It, it's right. a cost of doing business a little bit, but it doesn't, doesn't happen that often. It's few and far between. But my point was, and I found that when we go over the top with our, what, the way we stock it, people actually take way better care of our properties because they really appreciate it. They're like, man, this is awesome. They've got stuff that I, like you said, I wanted to, to buy this in my property. I've never had it. I've wanted to buy this for my home. I've never done it. And I come to this vacation world, they've got all the nicest stuff and they actually take way better care of it than you would like. They, it, the opposite is true when people are like, I'm worried they're going to steal it. I'm worried that they're going to not take care of the stuff we're spending so much money on. The actual opposite is true because it's that law of recipro reciprocity. They're looking at it saying, hey, man, these guys took a lot of care and time and effort to make this a great, like a great stock kitchen. I'm here for a, a special occasion. I've got everything I need and they take way better care of the properties. And to your point on the, that, the, that customer service. And I always tell people, you need to treat every single person like they're your only client and you value their business and you want everything to do to make one, you want that business. You want, like you said, you could tell the guy wanted the work. You could it, like, we want that when we're paying money right. to somebody, we right. want them to, we want them to say, Hey, listen, I'm paying a lot of money for this vacation. I want that person who I'm paying to appreciate it and go over the top 100%. and just, you know, act and operate with a smile on their face, like bring in the joy. Right. And so great piece of advice. I couldn't agree more. And I think it's a great exclamation point on the end of the conversation. So this is, this has been awesome, Chris. I really, really appreciate you joining me. I always, you know, again, like I said at the very beginning, it's always, there's so much to learn from everybody's journey. And it's always so helpful to be able to, where people listen to our podcast, they don't have to just listen to me talk. They can listen to so many successful investors like yourself, you and Claire, that are they're diving into this game and, and willing to share the story, the experience. And so I really appreciate it, my man. It, it's been it's been a really fun conversation for me. And I know for those listening as well. Me too. Thanks, Sean. I really appreciate it, my man. See you at the next one. We'll, we'll, yeah, we're, we're getting ready for our next 1% club meeting. We'll be, uh, we'll be ready to go. We might have to do it in your backyard now that it cools down a little bit. You told me, that's you told good. me 103 yesterday was manageable. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't even, that, that seems so hot to me. Like, uh, it's like, yeah. it's, but you can this, be in the sun every day. Yeah. yeah. We're going to, we'll, we'll, like, I love your, like, give me, give me another month or two and you're going to be about the perfect temperature for me to go visit down and down. Everyone in, down in the world is going to want to be here in a month. Everybody in the world, right? <laughs> That's when everybody comes. So guys, we're going to wrap it up today. Those of you listening, we know how valuable your time is and we really, really appreciate you spending it with us. If you've got anybody that would like to be a part of these conversations, I always ask you a couple of favors at the end of every episode. And that first one is share the show. And those things really help us. We don't run sponsorships or ads on these shows. So the only way we grow is organically if you guys share it. So if you know somebody else would like to be part of these conversations, get the word out, share it, send it to them on text via whatever platform you're watching or listening on. If you do have more than 30 seconds, give us a thumbs up and and, uh, a review on those platforms. Those things help us a ton and we very much appreciate it. And the final most important thing that I ask you at the end of every episode is pick that one thing you can do today to start building that life you don't want to take a vacation from. Cheers, my friends. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Vacation Rental Revolution podcast. Share this with other people you think need to hear about it. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. Hey, Grace, is there a website? Yes! For more amazing content and expert advice, visit bodicey.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode.